from New York City. This is a special edition of Auto Line This Week. Here now is your host, John McElroy. Welcome to AutoLine This Week. Typically, we come to you from Detroit, but today we're in the Big Apple, New York City. And joining me on today's show are John Murphy, an auto analyst with the Bank of America, Joe Philippi with Auto Trends Consulting, and Jamie Kitman, the New York Bureau Chief of Automobile Magazine. Join us for our discussion in the historic Stanford White Studio in the Chatwall Hotel. So, Jamie, John, and Joe, great having you here on AutoLine this week, and it's great to be in the big city, the Big Apple. But I've got to ask you guys, what blows me away whenever I come to New York is how much people are really into cars. I mean, here's a city where you're almost crazy to own one, and yet I can't believe how much people are into it. Jamie, why is that? Um, Well, a lot of people live in suburbs, first of all, but I think people just like cars. Uh, If you went to the New York Times editorial board where their view of the world is shaped in the taxi ride from West End Avenue down to the, the Gray Lady. Uh, you know, they, they seem to think people don't care, but they're always sort of shocked themselves when they run stories about cars and there's a huge reaction to it. Joe, you're, you're well, a guy. You know, uh, the Times, the, the, coming off what Jamie just commented on, you know, the Times does have this column called Wheels, and uh, it's a very well read column, and uh, they do a lot of interesting stories in it. And very often feature people in town that uh, are car collectors and, you know, from modest backgrounds. And they've got some really interesting old cars and stashed away in a garage somewhere, either in the city or out in Queens. But this is a big market. You know, we're looking at New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island. A huge market for every type of product that the automakers uh, manage to churn out every year. In fact, I've heard that if you look at the greater New York area, it's the single largest market in the country. Yeah, I think it's something on the order of like 16 million people are involved in, you know, in that 50-mile circle around New York City. So it's a, a lot of potential, a lot of sales potential here. And it's a big, big market for the, you know, premium and the luxury end, uh, you know, whether it's uh, SUVs, sedans, sports cars, you name it. It's, it's- and another thing not to forget is that thanks to Robert Moses, uh, New York City was really designed, you know, the modern New York City we know with cars in mind. I mean, they haven't done a lot of work, you know, for the last 30 or 40 mm-hmm. years. But prior to that, it was one of the first great auto cities. And, and that should be mentioned for those who don't know, Robert Moses is a guy who had an enormous influence in the city for laying out what it looks like today. Right. Truly. John, what do you think of why New Yorkers are so into cars? You know, I think there's a lot of people that are real, real, real familiar with the yellow Crown Vic and riding that almost every every day. So that's a big uh, that's a big draw in the city. But I also think there's a lot of dreamers in the city, uh, and they love to dream about bigger and better apartments and bigger and better cars. So I think it's a real aspirational market that draws a lot of people to the desire to own a car. I know if you look at the city, though, your, your carrying cost in a, on a garage is probably more than your car payment. So that keeps a lot of people at bay, but they all do really still dream. So what do you make of where the auto industry is right now? Two years flat on its, two years ago, flat on its back, everybody hurt, and not just the Detroit automakers, everybody was hurt, and now it, it just is rocking ahead. Well, I, I think we're in for a real boom time in, in the U.S. auto industry. We uh, hit uh, the mid-14s, or 14.5 for the first quarter for this year for a run rate basis. Uh, that's up from 12.7 last year. I think what you, you see in the autos that people tend to forget is it's a really big contributor to the economy. It was traditionally about 4% of GDP, dropped to 2%, is now beginning to recover, and it's going to start really kicking in in a big way to the economy as it really expands above 14 million units. It will start hiring because you're going to need more people to make all these cars, and it's going to be a really big exponential contributor to the economy. So I think it'll be a big deal for the economy. Joe, how, how, how good are the legs in this recovery? How long might this go on? Oh, I think we could have a three- to four-year run as we get back, you know, churn our way back to 17 million maybe in uh, four or five years. See, I love hearing you say that. Some people have told me, oh, it'll never go back to the old days. I, like you, believe it will. Well, you know, we took the market from 17 million, what, John's five or, no, six or seven years ago. 2000, 17, four, yeah. Right. You know, down to 10.2 or 10.3 million at the bottom. So, you know, you create a tremendous amount of, of pent up demand. You know, employment's picking up, credit is steadily opening up. You know, it's not great yet, but, you know, credit's getting better. So, you know, the economy's starting to gather some momentum. And the other thing that we haven't talked about yet is fuel prices. So if you've got a 10-year-old car uh, or, you know, or even older than that, um, you're kind of hurting from a fuel economy perspective. And now you get 
full-size sedans, you know, the Buick LaCrosse being one example, the new Impala that's uh, coming up, uh, I guess, late this year, early next year, you know, well up into the mid-30s in terms of fuel, highway fuel economy, depending on which engine option. Yeah, high 30s. In fact, and uh, Nissan just uh, announced the Altima, uh, which is, what, I think 38 miles per gallon highway? So right. that's uh, not a full-size sedan, but it's a good-size right. sedan, and that's pretty impressive fuel economy. Yeah, I mean, talking to one of the GM folks, they indicated that they're targeting for the new Impala with ESS 37 miles to the gallon. So, Jamie, i got to believe that a lot of this recovery has got to do with the fact that there's some pretty good product out there. I would think so. And, I, you know, it's ironic, but I think the high fuel prices, you know, have been fortunate for the car companies, going to Joe's point, um, that, that they really um, were going to be out on a limb. Certainly Ford was going to be out on a limb if, if prices, gas prices remained low, having invested all this money uh, in, in high-efficiency cars. Um, so I, th I think, you know, in, in a weird way, while it doesn't make anybody happy in the short term, I think in the long term it's going to be good. And yet that doesn't seem to dissuade people from buying high-performance cars or even trucks. I mean, truck sales may not be growing as fast as smaller cars, but they're growing strong. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a fact. Um, and, uh, you know, people, I think a lot of it is related to what their opti level of optimism is about the economy and as people feel more optimistic and, and as credit opens up because there's always people who will spend too much money if they can't give them a chance. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. One, of the, one of the real interesting things is used car prices are actually at all-time high. So when a lot of people are going into showrooms, they're finding it really easy to buy a new vehicle because they have two or $3,000 more in equity in the trade-in of the vehicle. So that is really pushing uh, people to buy more expensive cars, but also actually just to execute and close the deal and actually buy a new car. But that's, of course, because there's a shortage of good used cars. Nobody can get their hands on enough of them right now. It's one of the, one of the great knock-on effects of having really low sales from 2008 forward is there, weren't a lot, there aren't a lot of good late model used cars out there. So there's a real shortage. Despite what a lot of people say that there's too many cars in the United States, you might actually argue to drive three trillion miles a year, you need a lot more cars than we have on the road right now. But will that hurt the, the sales three, four years down the, uh, the road, Joe, as we fill up the, the used car uh, fleet, as it were? Uh, and it, would that impact new well, car sales? Well, re residual values will probably start to ease back. But if, if the economy is still humming and if em employment continues to, em you know, the overall employment numbers continue to improve and wages continue to grow, um, they'll start to offset each other. And I don't think that will have a negative effect on the, on the market. Jamie, uh, you were talking earlier that you've had a chance to drive uh, the new Maserati SUV. Uh, oh, no, 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 sorry. Um, I saw a reveal of the new Lamborghini SUV. Oh, Lamborghini SUV. Yeah. Oh, Lamborghini I, excuse me, is, that's, a, that's a big... Uh, after, after eight or ten years, the post-Volkswagen period, you know, uh, kind of reestablishing their sports car credentials, um, have... Um, shown, they, it's not official yet, it doesn't have a name, but they've shown an SUV that they want to uh, start selling pretty soon. Uh, they say maybe, but it looks like a done deal to, to everybody who was at this reveal. It's uh, not surprisingly, it's, it's very closely related to a Cayenne and the equivalent Volkswagens and probably the uh, new Bentley SUV that they're talking about as well. Um, and notably, they think they're going to raise their annual sales around 200 percent. I think they sold 1,600 cars in uh, 2011. They're expecting to go to 4,500 cars with the uh, SUV, the addition of the SUV to their lineup. Um, I'm sure they'll sell them. Personally, I, I thought it was a, a pernicious development and just stupid. But uh, did, you know, did you I, think I, that I, of the, the Porsche Cayenne when it I, first I'm came a, out? I'm afraid I do, and I still do. I still <laughs> think that uh, it was wrong for the brand. I think it was wrong for the brand. It, you know, it did. There's no question that people will buy those things. And I mean, there is with a Bentley SUV coming in Lamborghini and the Maserati and all, all the new Porsche SUVs. Uh, you kind of wonder if they'll run out of, like, you know, rich, you know, look at me people to buy them. But, um, but I think they'll, they'll, they'll make a lot of money in the short run. I think in the long run, when two-thirds of your product, in Lamborghini's case, is selling SUVs, you know, what, whatever your core brand value is starts to erode, and, and that has to happen. In Porsche's case, you know, they, you know, all that extra volume helped them do was lose control of, of the company, which was already extremely profitable. And while it may have served some larger Volkswagen, you know, 
world domination plan for them to you know wildly increase their vol volume and to share platforms and things like that i think it really you know dilutes it what does the porsche brand stand for now that you know 85 percent of what they sell is cayennes and panameras you know porsches now uh, a friend of mine, we were in a Panamera, and he said, this, this isn't true to the Porsche brand. And I said, well, no, it is, because the Porsche brand now is two and a half ton cars that are incredibly fast and handle surprisingly well for just like, you know, how large they are. And that, to me, you know, you lose something. And I wonder if Porsche took all the energy and money and time that they spent doing that, whether we wouldn't already have the 2,000 pound, you know, 200 horsepower, but just as fast, 911 that they probably could build, that they have the talent to build, and whether that wouldn't be a more exciting company. Very interesting points. Well, okay, the analysts, how do you guys see that? Is this, is this going into SUVs wrong for brands like uh, uh, Lamborghini and Porsche? I think from my perspective, it is, to be honest with you. I, mean, I, look, I looked at oh. that Bentley, monster Bentley SUV, and it's just like so over the top. I mean, clearly it's just an idea of where they want to go with it, but you know, some of the, the, uh, the jewelry on the car, the way they, they trimmed it out, and the front end, even the back end for that matter, was just way, way over the top. One, one thing about the luxury market, it, at least as it relates to the U.S. market, my experience in the, in the metropolitan area here is that it's very, very heavily driven by leasing. So you'll see, and I, I noticed in my neighborhood, you'll see someone driving a Range Rover that they've leased for two or three years, and oh, we did the Range Rover thing, now it's time to do the Cayenne thing, and then next year, it'll, or two years from now, it'll be time to do um, an Evoque, if you will. So I, I characterize it as leasing promotes disloyalty to the brand. It, you know, certain people, they'll lease their Mercedes, whatever, S-Class or E-Class forever, but there's a whole cadre of the, particularly the younger people, who love to try new things, so they just all they want to do is lease it. I've got a $700 a month car payment, as far as I'm concerned, for the rest of my life, and I'm just going to keep trying new things. So, so John, that's must put a, a real premium on constantly coming out with new product. Yes, it certainly does. I mean, I think when we look what's going on in the industry, just to comment on the, uh, you know, the, the luxury uh, CUVs or SUVs, if, if you will, I mean, I think a lot of these companies are looking at using their current architectures, sort of souping them up a little bit to create these larger vehicles. The Explorer is off the same platform as the, the Flex and the Taurus, so Ford is doing that. Uh, Porsche is doing that. Lambo, I'm sure, is doing that as well. So there might be a real business case here. There's a question of staying true to the brand or making money. I think a lot of these companies might be a little bit more focused on making incremental profits off some of the investments that they've made already so it's you know the enthusiasts might not be that happy with it the guys right. who are the equity owners might be might be happy with it so it's sort of a, a, a push and pull there on the on the profits versus the uh, loyalty to the brand right. but I think as far as the you know the, the product launches I think as we've seen this all uh, you know touring the New York Auto Show over the past couple of days is there's a ton of great product out there and we you know do this forecast each year we do a call car wars and the product that's coming out over the next three years is probably about 50 models uh, on average over the next three years. And that's a huge increase from about 35 over the last three years. So there's going to be a ton of new product that's going to pull people into the showrooms, not just on the, on the luxury side, but also on the mass market side, particularly in CUVs and, and the mid-car segment, which are big people mover segments, which really should pick up as the economy picks up. Back to that point, though, I, I, I would say that there's no question that it's like, for them, it must seem like there's money lying on the table. And certainly with the, um, the, the explosion in the Chinese market and the, and the you know, Russian market and the Indian market and, and all these people who you know, have rather vulgar taste, I, you, you know, there's no other way to describe it. Things like this Bentley SUV or the, or the Lamborghini, they're gonna, you know they're going to sort of appeal. But I, I sort of feel like there's an obligation that if you're the steward of a brand that's different than just being, you know, going out for the highest return. And that's, that's not just an auto industry problem, it's a societal problem that we have. But, you know, to say, you know, and, and you will say, you go like, to, you know, at a dinner after a couple of glasses of wine, you'll ask an executive, you know, like, what is with, like, you know, the Q7 Audi? It was like so, you know, like, what a, what a you know, abhorrent idea to traditional Audi fans. They go like, oh, but we were leaving so much money out there. You know, there's money to be made selling crack cocaine to school children, and just because you could make money doing it doesn't mean you should do it. And just because you could make money, you know, doing anything doesn't mean that's why you should do it. And I think that's 
Sadly, that's the best reason they really have. Well, this is interesting. So do you think uh, a few more years down the road, this is really going to hurt brands that are doing that? Oh, I, I think so. You know, they'll, they water themselves down and they, and they become, they're, the, you know, they, they kind of lose their initial fans. You know, they, I mean, you sort of saw it in, in a, it's not the, exactly analogous, but what happened to Saab? You know, they managed in a fairly short period of time to alienate everybody who was a Saab fan. And then, you know, they were doing what Joe was saying. There were people would go, well, that's a cheap lease price. I'll get that car and try it and see if it's any good. And, you know, it wasn't that great anyway. Uh, but, and they had lost their fans. And, and that happens a lot. And I, I think that ultimately that doesn't make for strong, you know, brands. I think it makes for weaker brands. But these manufacturers are all chasing the almighty dollar. So they can, you know, they... they but what keep, if Jamie's right? What if it really does end up hurting your brand? Well, we, we, we think it will, but I don't think they really give a damn. Right? As, <laughs> well, as long as the, op, the operating profit margin, you know, either stays high or gets to a new level and stays right. at that level, you know, I'd that's love to... A, but that's the fundamental problem is, is that there's this notion, and it's just, you know, it's capitalism is what we used to call it, that every quarter is supposed to be better than the quarter before. And, I, I, you know, I'm not in, in finance man so you know I mean that seems ridiculous to me because uh, nothing in life is ever that way there's no reason you should expect it. and there are even you know farmers let their fields lie fallow sometimes when you know it's the right time to do it but just that like money 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 now and not even like let's have a five-year plan it's like next quarter you know that's pretty much what the focus is it's it it creates you know it's uh, I would say the incentives are perverse I think the, the, the one thing to sort of focus on though with these companies is they're looking at five to six year life cycles on a, on a, on a product platform. They're spending one to two billion dollars on, on each platform. Amortizing that over a larger set of, of products does make a lot of sense. It's actually really not focused. You can see this at four. This is not something that's been focused on a quarterly basis, nor do they necessarily focus on each quarter for, for earnings. They focus on the long term, and that really began in 06. So I think you see some pretty good discipline coming from these auto executives more recently, at least in the companies that, that we cover. And I think it is, I am sort of hard pressed to believe that you shouldn't necessarily try to earn higher returns in the long run by producing more models off the same, same, the same platforms. I think there is a huge challenge on, on, on the luxury side. But I don't think the, you know, the Porsche 911 has really been that, that impaired by the, the, the Cayenne. I would argue maybe the Cayman going downstream is, is more damaging to the, to the 911 than, than the, the Cayenne is on the, uh, on the high end. Um, well, I, don't, I don't know if the sales bear that out. But I mean, I, I, your point is, is well taken, and there certainly is discipline. But I, I, I sort of feel, and you know, this is maybe an old-fashioned or perhaps you know, non-existent point of view, but just that, that they have an obligation to lead their customers somewhere rather than, you know, they'll go like, well, this is what our customers tell us they want. You know, that's, we have, that's why we have to sell them these things that really embarrass us anyway. But, um, but you know, you know, Porsche, for instance, um, you know, they, they articulated uh, um, a, a lifestyle and a brand and, and everything about it so well for so long. And it was that kind of focus that they start to lose. The other thing is that happens is that, you know, their luxury brands are supposed to be exclusive. And when you just go, oh, we're going to triple our volume, you know, overnight and with something that has nothing to do with us. Well, you know, it reminds me of I was in Los Angeles and Santa Monica um, about six months ago, and I was test driving a Bentley Continental, and I pulled up at a four-way traffic light, and there were six Bentley Continentals, including mine there. And, you know, uh, you know, the other guys were, I was laughing, but the other guys were kind of looking a little squeamish about it. All these luxury sales going so well, generating so many profits, uh, certainly in America and maybe not Europe right now, but most of the rest of the world, these car companies are making really good money. John, why is their stock really going nowhere right now? Well, I think there's, 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 a, there's a lot of reasons. Europe is, is certainly a big concern. All the mass market manufacturers have pretty good exposure. So do the luxury guys have pretty good exposure over there, or not so good exposure, but it's big exposure in the grand scheme of the companies. The U.S. market is, is, is really on fire right now. China's doing okay. South America is, is, is waffling a little bit. But if you get outside of North America, people are still nervous about what's going to happen in the macro global uh, economy. So the stocks are reflecting that right now. I do think as we get some semblance of stability, the USR continues to chug well above 14 million units. The stocks will begin to work. 
there's a lot of fear out there. You had two big manufacturers go bankrupt in the summer of 2009. We're in early 2012. That's not too long ago that we had big bankruptcies. So I think investors are, have a healthy level of skepticism, and they'll come around on these stocks over time as the cash flow is, continues to come through. Is that how you see it, Joe? Because yeah, I do. When you look at GM, Ford, and Chrysler, uh, certainly in their North American operations, they're at all-time record levels of profitability. Well, you know, they cut their costs, <clears throat> excuse me, dramatically. And it's amazing what happens when volume turns up and you get, get past using, you know, roughly 75 to 80 percent of your capacity. You know, the profitability just explodes. You know, if you look at what's happening with uh, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, uh, filling up Jefferson North, you know, adding a third shift. That, plus the fact that they've now taken, they've broken the $50,000 barrier for a Grand Cherokee. And the, the folks at, at Chrysler and Jeep often marvel at the fact that they, they don't seem to know where the, the top end of pricing on a, on a Jeep is, for example. And so you take a $25,000 Jeep Grand Cherokee, you dress it up in a, in a bit of a tux, and all of a sudden you're looking at close to $50,000 in terms of MSRP, and a huge amount of that drops to the bottom line. Getting back to Jamie's comment, um, I think the, the big three are much more disciplined in terms of you know, going after niches as opposed to looking at someone like BMW, probably the most uh, egregious example of taking a platform and slicing that, little, that chunk of cheese in as many thin little pieces as they possibly can with churning out a new iteration of a 5 Series or a 3 Series almost uh, every six months. Well, I think the difference is that BMW charge you for that variation. Oh, so whereas you see the mass market brands trying to simplify their manufacturing build by not having as many permutations to cut cost, BMW doesn't care at all, but they charge the customer right. for it. Don't you think that's a, a key reason why they're able to get away with having so much complexity in their manufacturing operations? Well, they do. And, and I mean, they get, they, they get paid very well for what they give you, all right? Um, the other thing is, as John was alluding, China, all right? an enormous market, huge growth in the, um, in, the, in the 1%, if you will, or the 1% or 2%. So there's a tremendous opportunity for premium and, and luxury vehicles in that market. And that's obviously uh, you know, gonna, gonna drive the numbers at, at, as well. Less so in South America, for example, but. Yeah, I think Joe hit on a, a very key uh, point for the Detroit 3, specifically on the Grand Cherokee and the price point being so high. I think one of the big changes in the industry is that you've gotten a very healthy level of inventory that's been worked down over a number of years. Really in the summer of 2009 was where we had this big washout uh, of inventory, cash for clunkers, GM and Chrysler taking uh, a lot of plants down. You're really very low on the inventory levels relative to history. So there's a real tightness on dealership lots right now, which is driving pricing higher, as well as this very disciplined focus by the Detroit Three, who historically didn't have a great focus um, on keeping inventory tight and pushing pricing higher. So that really is creating um, a real sort of halo for, for pricing and some of these higher, higher line products inside the Detroit 3 that nobody thought you could get better than $50,000 for before. It's, right. a real, it's a real boon for them and it does drop to the bottom line. See, thinking back to John's comment about the stocks, you know, what, the, the biggest single worry obviously is, a, is, a, is an inability in Europe to address the issues of over excess capacity in Europe. You know, no one wants to blink, no one wants to move first. And we look at the agony that GM's going through trying to deal with the Opal situation. Yeah, it's the old adage, everyone wants to go to heaven and nobody wants to die. But Jamie, <laughs> one of the things I'm worried about when I hear all this talk about pricing and whatnot, inventory levels uh, so tight, used car prices high, <clears throat> is simply the price of cars going up and up and up. I I'm thinking by 2015, we're going to see in the United States, the average, average vehicle sticker at about $35,000. Aren't we in danger of leaving a lot of people behind in the industry? Um, I don't think particularly more than, than in the past. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's, that's not what I lie away at night um, worrying about. Um, you know, people's ha houses are cheaper to buy now. That's the good news, I guess. So you can spend it on your car. Any, any comment on that? Well, I, I'm very concerned about the next, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years because cars are going to get incredibly expensive. Apropos your comment, as the car makers have to you know, take weight out, right, reduce mass dramatically, go to ever more sophisticated you know, powertrains, et cetera. And the, the 
the creep, and uh, I shouldn't even call it creep, it's going to be more of a gallop in terms of pricing over the next several years to, to meet the 54 mile per gallon standard. Um, it's going to put a lot of vehicles, new vehicles, if you will, out of the reach of a substantial number of consumers. Now the flip side would be, you know, well, they're forced into a used vehicle and that buoys up, you know, used vehicle prices and residuals and trade-in values. But I, I'm still very concerned that, um, that, that it's going to be, a, it's a problem for the industry and it could be worse than we expect, to be honest with you. Yeah, that incremental content, it definitely is a pressure point for the industry. I think one of, one of the interesting things is, though, that the industry has done a very good job of increasing the efficiency of the engine um, over time. That massive increase in efficiency, which has really been quite dramatic, has resulted in a massive increase in horsepower as opposed to better fuel economy. If you were to look at a car 10 years ago, it now has 30 to 50 percent better horsepower today than it did 10 years ago. So there's been a huge push for sort of this gluttonous you know, drive for, for horsepower on, on the pickup truck side on the, and even in the mid-car platform, the, the basic family movers. So I do think over time there's going to be more content that comes in as you keep that horsepower high. I'm not sure that the industry can't slowly address this over time and they can push the pricing up for, for consumers, but it is a risk. And on that note, we're going to have to close it up. But Jamie, John, and Joe, thanks so much for coming Thank on AutoLine this week. Very interesting thanks. discussion. Thanks a lot, John. What a great discussion that we had today. Everything from technology to car sales to luxury vehicles. In fact, maybe a little too much luxury. I've really got to thank my guest today, Jamie Kitman from Automobile Magazine, John Murphy from the Bank of America, Joe Philippi from Auto Trends. Hey, join us again here next week for another edition of AutoLine This Week.